All right, let's talk about respiratory system today. Um, this is a topic that is obviously relevant to the cardiology work that you've done. Uh, the interplay between those systems is, is uh, obviously very, very tight. But the oxygenation that happens in the lung, that of course uh, affects how every other organ operates, not just in obvious ways in terms of getting oxygen to the tissue so that it lives, but, but very, very uh, uh, complex and important pH regulation aspects that we'll talk about uh, that would surprise you how, how tightly linked they are, and uh, a whole host of other issues. So this is a, a pretty uh, exciting and important, important lecture. Any announcements before we get going? Is everything okay? Um, it's diary related. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. It's a highly worthy announcement. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the respiratory system. And we'll talk about the physiology, the anatomy, how that plays into the diffusion and the task that it's uh, trying to achieve. And then we'll get very quickly to disorders and their treatments and some of the exciting opportunities for uh, engineers. You know, the, uh, the timing of loss of Respiratory function is very crucial, as you know. This is uh, what happens if you stop oxygenating, if you have respiratory failure for any reason. Uh, and actually, not commonly known, but the first thing that happens is before you get to brain damage, the, the heart starts to be dysfunctional. When you have uh, poor oxygenation, uh, you start to have a higher risk of arrhythmia, altered uh, conduction. You can imagine how that might be the case in a structure that says, uh, finely tuned in terms of timing and the directed flow of electrical activity uh, th through the heart. You actually have a very serious problem early on in the first minute or so. Then, of course, brain damage, uh, the next uh, very serious issue that happens, and that's because the brain does not have uh, uh, a capability for dealing with non-oxygen-dependent metabolism in the way that other tissues do. It has very high metabolic demands. That uh, issue becomes uh, irritable. So extremely important uh, and a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, there are more subtle intermediate states that can happen. So at some level, the whole setup of the respiratory system is to deal with uh, this uh, exact problem, the diffusional issue. You have to get gas exchange working. Uh, you have to create a surface area for gas exchange, and basically the uh, uh, it's not just the surface area, it's the, uh, not just the area available for diffusion, but it's the concentration gradients that are relevant for the gases. That's going to set a diffusion rate. Uh, the rate of uh, transfer of material is, turns out to be proportional to the area to a diffusion coefficient. If you've got uh, obstruction, or you've got fibrosis, or you've got mucus, you've got occlusion of that uh, pathway, that's going to increase your diffusion. Uh, and then, of course, it's the concentration gradients. That are. Typically, when you think about evolution and structure of the respiratory system, you're, you're trying to maximize the surface area, and you're trying to, to decrease the distance that's required. Now, different organisms, of course, need respiratory systems. Others do not. Uh, and this is sort of the surface area to volume ratios. You look at different organism sizes. Uh, and you can see there's this uh, uh, obviously very pronounced change. Flies do not need an, an active uh, uh, lung-based system. They uh, do have the inflow pathways for gases to enter into the um, uh, side of the organism. Of course, if you get very small, you've got extremely high surface area. It becomes much a, more acute for larger organisms. So the lungs are a beautiful way of using branching uh, to create high surface area. You've got uh, the trachea, the main uh, 
and flow pathway at branches right and left main stem bronchi, and then those go into bronchioles, which uh, further uh, till they become terminal bronchioles, and ultimately in a sac, an alveolar sac, which is a little outpouchings of this uh, terminal bronchi. Each of those alveolar sacs or alveoli is very heavily invested with capillaries, of course, so that's a gas exchange uh, to be happening. But, and they need to be uh, right next to each other. So scales are interesting uh, to think about uh, in terms of uh, the progression uh, from the trachea uh, down to the alveoli. Position between the job is just a conduction or transmission of uh, of the gases, and then get to the much smaller structures, the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs. That's where uh, the tissue is clearly set up, not just for conduction, but for uh, this direct gas exchange uh, with the fluid. So, what does that air-blood interface look like? If you think about it, that's pretty hard. You've got a blood vessel, and you've got a sac of air. How do you bring them? close together, maximally close together, uh, to create the shortest possible distance for diffusion to happen. It's pretty amazing how close it gets. So this, this is a beautiful image, this electron micrograph that really, uh, what is this? This is a capillary. EN stands for endothelial cell. This is the nucleus of the endothelial cell, EN. This trace around the membrane, this is the capillary, and this is the inside of the capillary. Capillary lumen or sleep. It's, it's basically a cell. Your final capillary is just a cell. The nucleus is squashed off to one side, and look how thin endothelial uh, cell uh, actually is. Uh, and this is the inside of it. This is what is this here? Do you think black thing? Blood cell, maybe sort of a deformed, squashed red blood cell. And then what's going on here? Well. This, you know, you've got your endothelial cell nucleus, uh, and then you've got an epithelial cell that's the uh, uh, cell that's providing some structure to the blood vessel. Here is your gas. This is the, uh, look at the distance. This is pretty amazing. This, this is the two cell membranes that are maximally squashed uh, to, to uh, transition across, and then you've got your inside a blood vessel and the blood vessel. That's how it's set up, extremely uh, beautifully designed. Now, then you've got to think about the uh, effective uh, pressure differentials, the, the equivalent of a concentration gradient as a partial pressure uh, differential in the respiratory system. About the uh, various pressures that are involved at atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters. You've got, uh, you know, a chiefly Large, very large composition of nitrogen, some oxygen, very small uh, contribution from those partial pressures sum up to give you uh, atmosphere. Uh, but it's not, you know, so, so your oxygen is actually um, a minority component, but it's actually even less because the air in your lung is humidified, and so you've got a water uh, partial pressure as well, and that's about to be uh, pretty significant. So uh, when you factor all these things in the partial pressure of inspired oxygen, you take a hit from the humidification, and it's about 150 uh, millimeters of O2 partial pressure of the air that's uh, sitting here. So that's one thing you're, you're thinking about in terms of the, the gas. Then some other, another separate principle that's involved is, is the uh, pressures that are keeping the Alveolar uh, sacs inflated that are uh, inflating uh, pressure and volume. Uh, this is to keep in mind in the course of the class is the simple pressure volume relationship. Things uh, NRT don't change much in the course of normal uh, life, but pressure and volume change. Okay, so now let's think about the passage of blood along a capillary near an alveolar sac. And let's think about what's happening as it goes uh, along uh, its progression. It's sort of analogous to our discussion of the kidney, thinking about 
the blood vessel going through the glomerular uh, tuft as it's exposed to Bowman's capsule, what's happening to the various concentrations of things as it goes, and those change as you go along. Same thing here. You've got your uh, capillary passing by an alveolar sac. That's coming out, obviously, a simplified. And let's think about the timings. Well, it takes you know, less than a second for the blood in the capillary to, to pass by the alveolar sac. So that's not much time. Okay. Uh, so what's happening in this uh, time? It's from the point of view of a red blood cell, it's transitioning from... Well, you've got two processes going on. You've got a perfusion rate, which is how blood is passing through the capillary. And then you've got a diffusion process, gas exchange going on as, as that... Uh, Different gases have different diffusion rates, and not just subtly, massively different. And that creates this fundamental distinction between is the change of a gas diffusion limited or perfusion limited. Let's start with carbon monoxide as an extreme. So, it, the, the interesting thing about carbon monoxide, it's uh, what we say it's diffusion limited. It never reaches a very high Partial pressure rises very slowly. It has a very high affinity for hemoglobin quickly, but it no, the, the partial pressure never reaches the maximal level that's present uh, uh, in the alveolar sac because of that. So um, uh, it rises uh, very slowly. Opposite, nitrous oxide has nothing to bind to. It's completely inert as far as the blood is concerned, and so it partial uh, pressure uh, matching the blood and the air very quickly. And oxygen is somewhere in between. O2 is somewhere in between. Uh, and depending on how well the diffusion is happening, the membranes uh, representing the endothelial and epithelial uh, barriers uh, in different disease states or mucus production states and so on. You or abnormal oxygen, but you can see you can trans transition from something. It's a concept that turns out to be very important uh, uh, clinically. And different uh, graphical ways of, of representing uh, this finally is, is comparing the oxygen, which is sort of analogous to what I just showed you, and then last major gas to think about, which is carbon dioxide, and that is also riding on this transition of perfusion diffusion limitation. Uh, normally, you lose all the carbon dioxide that can be lost when you match the alveolar carbon dioxide pressure. You lose that about halfway through the capillary. Obviously, you're not going to go below that. You can't lose carbon dioxide to a lower pressure than it as you can go when things equilibrate. But if there's any abnormality to that process, then uh, you can end up with still some CO2 in your capillary after it's uh, left the action zone with the... So oxygen and carbon dioxide live in that... Uh, then there are other interesting things that happen inside the red blood cell itself that have to be kept in mind. Now here's where this whole pH issue So, um, you've got your red blood cell, and you've got oxygen and carbon dioxide sloshing around outside. Uh, oxygen passes more or less freely across the membrane. It interacts with hemoglobin. Okay. Takes you from deoxygenated to oxygenated uh, hemoglobin. Relatively straightforward. Carbon dioxide is a little more complicated, so it can diffuse pretty freely, but it reacts with water uh, in, a, in a manner that's uh, catalyzed by a very important carbonic anhydrase. And that creates carbonic acid, which then immediately creates proton, and so you're acidifying inside of your red blood cell. Now that's good in a way, that lets your, you know, that has a couple uh, actually important uh, First of all, that can actually uh, alter the hemoglobin properties in an important way. 
uh, affect the oxygen uh, affinity. But also, you've got to think about uh, what this does. This, this process, this carbonic anhydrase, is present not only in red blood cells, but it's present in other body tissues. You've got this exchange of CO2 and acidity that affects how basically every organ in the body operates. Here, uh, if you have a process that greatly elevates your carbon dioxide, not breathing enough, carbon dioxide is building up, you're going to become acidotic. You're going to have increased acid uh, basically everywhere because of this process, because of this facilitated uh, production. This would be what you might call a respiratory acidosis. Okay? You're not breathing enough. You're not losing enough carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is building up and becoming acidotic. And any problem associated with acid anywhere in your body can be a consequence of respiratory acidosis. Now, you, you can have the opposite. You could have a respiratory alkalosis. If you breathe too quickly, you're going to be blowing off too much carbon dioxide and you're get, going to get to lower levels of CO2. That'll actually drive your pH potentially harmfully in the other direction. What kind of things might make you breathe quickly? Panic attack, absolutely. That's always high on the differential. It's amazing how often that happens. Altitude, sure, yeah. If you're detecting uh, uh, that sort of uh, uh, happen, that actually can happen. Certainly altitude changes can happen. You can also, here's another final interesting thing. It can be in response to um, a metabolic problem. And so you can have elevated acid that's occurring uh, Due to a, a metabolic process, you can have a metabolic acidosis, then you can have a respiratory compensation. Your body's smart enough to say, hey, we've got a, a great way to uh, uh, get rid of uh, excess acid. We can breathe more quickly, and we can drop CO2 and, and compensate for acidosis that way. And so that, that becomes a very interesting thing. You can have someone who's breathing very quickly because their body's responding to an uh, acidosis that started from a completely separate non-respiratory so that is a respiratory compensation to a metabolic acidosis. So you can start to see the sort of complexity that goes on, and it can work the other way, too, uh, in important uh, ways. Uh, and we'll get into uh, questions that help you sort of sort through these, these differences. Okay, now you've got to think about the difference between what's going on in the lung target tissue. So uh, this curve, the hemoglobin saturation curve, is a very important curve. What's plotted here is partial pressure of oxygen, x-axis, and percent saturation of hemoglobin on the y-axis. Get from 100% to 0%. First thing you notice is it's nonlinear. It's got a cooperativity to it. Describes this. Um, than one. And what that does is it allows uh, a, a very efficient unloading of uh, oxygen in tissue. Okay. And so under normal operation, the hemoglobin becomes uh, completely saturated. Or, uh, basically every hemoglobin is fully occupied by oxygen. In tissue, the partial pressure of oxygen is actually obviously much less than it would be in the lung. That facilitates the unloading of hemoglobin. And see there's a fair bit of reserve. So actually most hemoglobin is not unloaded uh, fully by the time it leaves uh, the uh, reserve uh, can lead to substantial tolerance to uh, very but it's not uh, uh, complete. Here is a question. So a subject inhales several breaths of a gas mixture containing low concentration of carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide. 
which of the following statements is false? We've got, we've got these two things, carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide. These are the non-normal gases, but they occupy these extremes. Carbon monoxide is completely diffusion limited. The partial pressure never rises very high because it's got this high binding. Nitrous oxide, the opposite, doesn't bind anything, rises very quickly. Okay, partial pressures of CO in alveolar gas and end capillary blood will be virtually the same. <coughs> partial pressures of nitrous oxide in alveolar gas and end capillary blood will be virtually the same. Carbon monoxide is transferred into the blood along the whole length of the capillary. All the nitrous oxide will be taken up in the early part of the capillary. The uptake of carbon monoxide can be used to measure the Picked answer one, which is correct. A lot of people pick two. Let's go through each of them just to make sure we understand which one. Which one is false? Well, nitrous oxide, it's it's tempting because it's it's so true. So nitrous oxide, the pressure rises very quickly, and it very quickly matches the alveolar concentration by the time you get to the end of the capillary. Certainly it's going to be true. In fact, that's true. Yeah, what perfusion really means is that it's not it's not uh, diffusion limited and it depends on how the, the net amount that you transfer into the body depends on how effective the blood is through the capillary. That one is true, so it's not false, um, but it's certainly tempting. Carbon monoxide is transferred into the blood along the whole length of the capillary. That's also true. It happens uh, slowly, continuously, does not reach completion. There's a net transfer. This is also true, almost all the nitrous oxide is taken up in the early part. And this is also true because it's so diffusion limited, you can actually, that's a, a way you could detect, you could do this in an animal model certainly, uh, uh, detect the uh, subtle changes in diffusion. But uh, one is, is false, let me just move this. Partial pressures of CO in the alveolar gas and end capillary blood will be virtually the same. Oh, that's false. They don't approach each other uh, at all. That was uh, definitely a challenging one. All right, so now let's think about uh, the alveoli in a little more uh, detail. We have um, some useful numbers for you to keep in mind to help you think about the, the system as it's helpful to think about volumes uh, and, and think about both uh, capillary and then addition, which is what's happening. Back, fusion, we've got fusion, we've got. So the tidal volume, that's about the volume of each breath. It's about half a liter. For a minute, you end up with about 7,500 milliliters per minute. Now, not all of that gets gas exchanged. A lot of it's in this conduction spot, what you might think of as anatomic dead space. There's your trachea dead space. There's not gas exchange. It's not heavily invested with, with capillary. Um, so really, your LV, and that's also true of, of uh, physiologic dead space. It's not strictly anatomical due to mucus and so on. Uh, 
really, your alveolar ventilation is a little less. It's about five liters. Uh, the actual uh, gas content on your alveoli per se is about 3,000 uh, milliliters. Um, the pulmonary blood flow is also about five uh, liters per minute. That's typical cardiac output. All the blood goes you know, through the lungs. Now, um, I mentioned this tidal volume. What other lung parameters are relevant? Different things can go wrong. This is your sort of tidal volume. It's like a tide. It's just how you're normally breathing. As you know, you can actually increase, take a deep breath in, inspire deeply. And so you've got a, a higher total lung capacity than your typical tidal volume uh, gets you to. And also, expire more deeply than you normally Maximal voluntary vital capacity in and out, that's called your vital capacity is much, much greater than your typical. Now, um, there are actually, you, there's some that you can't even push out. So you maximally push out as much as you can, so that's still some there, okay, and that's called the residual uh, volume, okay. Important when thinking about gas. You've got a th few different relevant things, residual volume plus Vital capacity is a total lung. Some parts of these can go wrong. You can imagine, for example, uh, if there was a, a process that impaired the expansion of a lung maximally, have your tidal volume might be okay for a while, but your, vital, your total lung capacity might be dropping, and then as the disease state progresses, approach into the uh, tidal volume and or a little bit before that, uh, exercise relevant tidal volume, which would be a little great. How a disease process can be going on for a while before it's. Uh, so, uh, there's a few interesting things going on. There's a propensity of alveoli to collapse and for the lung to collapse. And why is that the case? Well, there's Part of it is uh, water uh, surface tension, okay? So you've got uh, this natural uh, hydrogen bonding that water likes to do, creating immense surface tension, and the natural uh, condition would be for everything to collapse. And so you've got, and that can happen in various disease states. It's not the end of the world. But if the alveoli collapse, that's going to reduce the ventilation that's happening in part of the lung, but not another part that has not collapsed. That's not affecting the blood flow. The blood flow is still going through. And then you've, what you've got then is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. A lot of your blood that's going through the lung is going through alveoli that are not inflated. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to reduce the oxygen available to the blood because a lot of the blood, even though the heart's perfectly fine, even though the lung's being perfectly well perfused, some of it's not being going through alveoli that are not uh, ventilated. Then you can get the opposite that can happen. Uh, what, what if you had a, uh, uh, an embolism? What if you, you know, clotted off part of a blood vessel going to the lung? Uh, well, your lung's still being perfused. You've got ventilation coming through. But you're not perfusing that part of the lung. And so you've got a, a different kind of. Uh, uh, and so there's, there's a different things that can happen. Uh, and, and the balance between those can be diagnosed by different measures that will. Now, the flow is complex. Uh, there's, um, you know, at, at low speeds, it's, uh, it's a Newtonian fluid. It has constant properties. Uh, incompressible form of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, relatively straightforward, but involves the density of the fluid, velocity, pressure, a viscosity measure, and then a uh, salt term for other body forces uh, help us understand the, the flow at, at, at low speeds. Now, um, for a first approximation that actually works, uh, and you can actually even model the walls as uh, rigid and flow as uh, laminar. But uh, at high flow rates, uh, you start to get into uh, turbulent flow. And so in large vessels, uh, the flow is not laminar. And so you can get uh, relatively uh, difficult model uh, properties and then a transitional 
where the, the flow is actually quite difficult to understand. So often we want to measure, not just model, but actually measure because our models are not going to be good enough. And so um, have various devices that we use to measure respiration flows, uh, pressures, volumes. And one very simple device is basically a strain gauges, basically by stretching up a strap that you can wear on the, the chest uh, to detect chest expansion. Um, there are piezoelectric uh, devices that can be used to measure. Um, in laboratory uh, settings, you can use Doppler uh, setups to, to detect uh, chest wall motion. It's also true that breathing is a little complicated. Um, the diaphragm, which is this a sheet of muscle that more or less forms the border between your thorax and your abdomen. That's a fractal muscle uh, that regulates the expansion and contraction of the thorax. But also all your ribs <coughs> have muscles between them and those are synchronized as well and help facilitate the uh, uh, contraction of the, uh, of the thorax. And those are called intercostal muscles. Those are little strips of muscle that uh, lie between and uh, those can fail in different settings. Uh, if you have uh, a rib fracture uh, and, or if you disrupt uh, intercostal muscles, you can have localized uh, impairments in uh, inflation of the chest wall and that can cause local uh, problems, uh, impaired uh, ventilation. Those are uh, things that change uh, their shape very rapidly in response to an I've actually, I haven't seen these in operation. Jay, have you seen these? Uh, in, in? So there are, but they're used, uh, basically a small electrical pulse causes a, a very instantaneous. Um, uh, sort of on the forefront of uh, items that can be used. In you can also measure uh, gas exchange with uh, labeled Particles. And this is done primarily in normal models, but uh, can also be done. The rat, though, is actually a good uh, model um, for human respiratory development. There's this uh, transition process between what's called the saccular stage and the fully developed uh, alveolar stage. We're born, a lot of our alveoli still. Many of them are still sort of little outpouchings, uh, look like just little outpouchings at the end of a terminal bronchial. And you don't have this fully uh, developed uh, sort of cluster of grapes-like uh, structure. And obviously that's pretty important in thinking about the uh, surface area to volume ratios and the dynamics. Of uh, rats also have that process. They're born with their lungs in sort of the saccular. Developed alveolar stage. Uh, that's actually good because then you can use rats to study uh, uh, nanoparticles, thinking about drug delivery, and then you can go in and histologically assess. You can try different uh, particle sizes. You can look at different uh, ages of the uh, uh, rats become adult by the time they're about old, and you can actually see different particles get deposited uh, with different efficiency stages, and that's important for understanding designing treatments for. Uh... Okay, so let's get back to the uh, acid issue. This is something that deserves a detailed uh, discussion, and uh, we'll do some even uh, sample calculations that help you understand this. Um, so this is the whole carbonic acid issue, H2CO3. Uh, it's a major source of uh, interaction between the metabolic and the respiratory. Um, so, uh, and it goes both ways. So you can actually have, you know, I'm, I, we talked about a respiratory compensation to a metabolic acidosis. But it also goes the other way. If someone stops breathing as much and has a primary respiratory problem and has acid buildup and they can metabolic uh, compensation I help remove some of the extra acid. metabolic uh, compensation respiratory acidosis or or an alkalosis it can go both 
Uh, and how are all these things picked up and detected? Well, a lot of it is um, passive, but there's some very active neural detection. There are uh, receptors in the central nervous system that detect uh, acid. Uh, there are also uh, detectors for uh, oxygen. And a lot of this information gets integrated with the medulla, which are uh, pain neurons that uh, are basically a respiratory center that then send uh, information motor neurons that control the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and help regulate the strength. Uh, and depth of the, those then affect CO2. Okay, so pH is tightly regulated. It's usually about 7.4 plus or minus about 0.04. Uh, it's a little lower in cerebral spinal fluid. It's about 7.2. Tight range. That gives you a low but important concentration. But it's very highly uh, buffered. Uh, there are many things that are partially occupied by protons, and a little shift in one way or another will cause them to change their proton occupancy, and you'll have not much overall change in the pH of the blood, which is good. That's what you want. What are the buffers? Well, uh, water itself then is, of course, a, a buffer in the form of uh, HCO3. It's partially occupied, and uh, a small rise in protons uh, can actually lead to the creation of CO2 and water without a big change in, in pH. Also, hemoglobin, other uh, proteins, albumin, phosphates that are present in blood all act as buffers as well. Very heavily buffered. This. Uh, Relationship, uh, important to keep in mind, you can actually, uh, it's called the Henderson, Henderson Hapkin. Uh, basically, the uh, association constant of uh, carbonic acid, that's outcome of the, the product of the outcome of the reaction to the initial, you can solve for pH. Gives you this 6.1 plus the log of the ratio of HCO. This basically is pretty useful because this uh, lets you think about blood pH, partial pressure of CO2, CO3, and how they relate to each other. I would take a little time, think about what happens. Carbon dioxide goes up. If carbon dioxide goes down, think about which way mass action is going to push this reaction. What's that going to do to? to Think about uh, various kinds of bodily compensations. And let's talk about some examples. Let's talk about the respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. As we know that the carotid chemoreceptors uh, are very responsive. Uh, they can affect uh, gas. acid balance for that reason. Let's think about two primary respiratory problems, respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. Okay, respiratory acidosis. These are the sorts of diseases that can give rise to it. Basically, the common theme here is reduced ventilation of the lungs. Therefore, you're not blowing off enough CO2. Pushing this Hasselbach equation and that reaction in one direction. You're making more protons in the blood. Bronchitis, asthma, pneumonia, head injuries, myasthenia. Why would bronchitis do this? Bronchitis is going to give you a Bronchitis, lung inflammation, mucus production, barrier diffusion, okay? Get less carbon dioxide blown off, and that's going to build up. What about asthma? Mucus there. What is asthma? Yeah. So asthma is a 
looks like what's the most important process going on is constriction of the uh, pathways for airflow. That's reducing the ventilation, and so you get reduced gas exchange for that reason. Well, you know, people with asthma can also get into a state where they're, because they're having difficulty, that can create a hyperventilatory state uh, as a result where they take many shallow breaths and it, you can have this uh, overcompensation. Um, uh, that is not uncommon, actually, and that can look a little bit like uh, anxiety. Pneumonia. Similar bronchitis, you've got infiltrates, you've got inflammation. Emphysema, what is, what is emphysema? I hear a lot about it, what actually is it? So this, so this is, Emphysema is actually a bit of a complex histological process, but the main issue is that you've got to, uh, due to problems like uh, chronic smoking or chronic exposures, you have breakdown of the structural integrity overall of the lung, which would include alveoli, but also the uh, elastin fibers that help regulate its elasticity. And so you actually have a problem. The lung can't uh, expand fully. It actually looks like a little bit like asthma in some ways, even though the bronchi themselves are uh, not constricted in the way that they are in, in asthma. Uh, but because of the lung is not elastic, it, it can't uh, inflate as, as fully. And so that actually creates head injury. How's that going to happen? Yeah, so you could have pons medulla that would regulate your automatic regulation of blood flow. You can also have disruptions in your voluntary control as well. It affects the neural structures involved. Any gravis? How's that going to reduce your ventilation? Yeah, neural control, so, you know, it's a disease of the neuromuscular junctions, and, and so your muscles, your, you know, your muscles are going to be weaker, effectively. You're not going to, no matter how hard the nervous system is trying to, to drive them, uh, your inspiratory muscles, your diaphragm, your intercostals are going to be weaker. Alkalosis, flip side, a lot of things we talked about. If you're breathing too much, hyperventilation and anxiety or drug use. A lot of fever states, uh, inflammatory states, cytokines, and so on, you can end up getting elevated respiratory rate, rates, uh, fever-like. Asthma, we could talk about that. We talked about that compensation. Uh, head injury, you can get increased uh, respiration as well. Um, basic problem here is that increased ventilation leads to increased. The patient with asthma is brought into the emergency department with a respiratory distress. The patient is breathing extremely rapidly. What initial acid-base derangement abnormality do you anticipate this patient to have? Respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, or metabolic.
key thing here is initial, of course. Um, patient with asthma, primary problem, almost always impaired ventilation, respiratory acidosis. Then you have this compensation. They can't play as much as they'd like. They can't pass as much air as they'd like. And you often get this very rapid shallow breath thing that overcompensates. That could compensate to the right level. Depending on this patient's particular time course, you might measure their blood pH. It might be perfectly normal. That would be because they'd had a, a compensation that have overshot. You might have a respiratory alkalosis. The initial problem, and the clue is it's a patient with asthma, very likely initial problem. Now that word asthma there is very important. What if, what if it was a, you know, and here's where your, your clinical judgment is so important. You have to look at the history. What if it was a patient with diabetes or some, some uh, you know, uh, medical issue? And, and this case study read a patient with, you know, diabetes is brought into the ER with respiratory. Everything else looking exactly the same. In that case, I might guess metabolic acidosis. And what's going on with the rapid rate is that's a respiratory compensation going on. And so a lot depends on the, the clinical history. It's very important. There had to be something that state of like they might have acidosis and have compensation. Should we assume it's just like for whatever reason the acid Almost always, yeah, it's it's a very good question actually. And the the cause and effect chains can can be quite intricate. And, and you could have had, you could have had, maybe this was a patient with asthma, and their trade-off was some, who knows, some bizarre metabolic acidosis they got that then um, decompensated them exactly as you're saying. That absolutely could happen. And so you'd have to, you know, this is, you know, we anticipate, we expect, you know, we expect common things to be common. Your first guess, the most common thing is, is not that a patient with asthma had some bizarre metabolic thing happen. But it could, it could always be the case. Oh, so, yeah. Why then they go into a state of respiratory yeah. acidosis? Great question. So, you know, a lot of people are compensated, uh, whether with medications, uh, you know, maybe a, a particular patient, you know, they, they have asthma, they've got their bronchodilators, they've got their anti-inflammatories. But, uh, you know, uh, pollen in the air, an irritant, Causing an additional hyperconstriction of the bronchioles, you know, some event like that, uh, a cold, you know, uh, uh, anything that would just tip them over the edge could, could trigger this. Given what we know here, you know, we expect this to be the case. What you're saying, you know, could happen later. And so after this initial presentation, a lot of things happen. You go and measure the blood pH, decide if they're acidotic or alkalotic. If the patient is alkalotic, if they're in this number two state, as you're saying, that need not be permanent. By itself, it could resolve. This alkalosis could then trigger uh, a correction, normalization of the drop, and then pH would happen in a subsequent pH measurement might reveal exactly what you're saying, and that's what's going on. This is early in the process. The patients just come in.
some people may need acute intervention. Um, so when, how would you treat this patient? Well, they may come in and you're going to give them uh, bronchodilators. You might give them, you know, a whole range. You'll give them, you know, prosympathetics, anticholinergics. You'll give them steroids, potentially, shut down inflammation. You'll try to correct it as aggressively as you can. Okay, let's uh, make sure, I'm going to leave, make sure you Okay, so um, emotional disorders, we've talked a lot about asthma. There's a lot of different ways that pathology can be. Uh, Some of these are sort of uh, uh, happen through our uh, environmental exposures, uh, rapid changes in uh, nitrogen partial pressures. Uh, Bends. This is a rapid ascent uh, in a diver. Uh, actually, create uh, nitrogen being forced into blood in the form of uh, bubbles. That uh, can actually be fatal. Um, air emboli in various uh, settings can also be fatal. Uh, elevated pressures of oxygen can be useful in, in settings. One of the more interesting ones is in infection, gangrene, or, or tetanus, where a lot of those. Bacteria actually require a, a low oxygen environment to survive, and you can actually kill them with high pressures. And sometimes you can also, sometimes if someone has carbon monoxide poisoning, for example, you can uh, really drive excess uh, oxygen. Uh, pneumonia, we talked a little bit about this. This is a chest x ray of someone with pneumonia. Normally the lungs are pretty transparent to x-rays. You've got your uh, heart sitting here. This is your diaphragm. Here's someone with pneumonia. A lot of things going on. Uh, a little bit focal. So you've got uh, possibly a, a left uh, a lung process, maybe lower. Uh, you can't see the border between the heart and lung very clearly. That's an indication of inflammation. Global uh, increase in capacity that Due to uh, inflammation, infiltrates of uh, fluid and uh, in the inside. Um, basically, pneumonias can be anything that inflames the lung, chemicals, infectious agents, all those things. Problem, and you have uh, impaired uh, ventilation for that reason. I think compensations happen when you have low oxygen states. You actually, see uh, studies in. Dogs. Uh, this is a size dog looking at its respiratory pattern. Right here, you drop the oxygen concentration to 5% from its normal point. This uh, slowly developing increased frequency and uh, depth of respiration. Things are being measured here. Okay, you've got uh, blood pressure, you've got respiratory. actually see carbon dioxide actually dropping uh, as their lungs are working uh, harder to compensate for the low oxygen. So you're ending up with uh, an artificially low carbon dioxide because of this lower And um, what's interesting then is you can actually, if you restore normal oxygen, get an apneic period, a period where respirations uh, completely stop, and that's because Oxygen is now present, and you're no longer driving increased respiration. Uh, but now you've got a problem with your CO2, and so your body has to stop breathing for a little while in order to allow that. And so that's a common basic theme: is hyperventilation disorders cause this uh, basic uh, problem um, that affect your subsequent uh, respiratory rates. Acute intervention for that is, you know, the brief bag uh, type thing where you can use artificial oxide levels to normalize uh, your, your blood. Talk about emphysema. As I mentioned, this is the destruction of the elastin fibers, less uh, recoil of the lungs. They can't 
actually expand. It looks like an obstructive pattern. You also can get that with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. This is a gradual buildup of uh, impaired uh, diffusion, uh, uh, increased mucus and inflammation and destruction of the often associated with uh, shows up uh, with labored breathing. Bronchitis is a more acute problem, typically uh, can be. Lead to COPD or be part of COPD, but also can be present in an acute inflammatory state, uh, irritants, infections, cause increased mucus production. Uh, oh. Tuberculosis, what does that do? Well, this is a infectious agent, mycobacterium tuberculosis spread through uh, uh, aerosolized uh, cough particles, lives in alveoli in the lungs. Um, and you can diagnose it uh, with uh, blood tests. Um, takes a long time to cure, about 12 months of multiple antibiotics for FAMPA and IPA. Is it? Uh, it's interesting, it's, you know, it's been uh, more associated with uh, uh, poor hygiene conditions, often associated with poverty. Uh, more than a million uh, people die from TB and is falling a little bit as HIV gets more under control in areas where HIV is under control, but not where it's not, of course. Uh, up with uh, very high rates in. Uh, you can see uh, better certainly where HIV is less than tightly linked to uh, poverty related. And concomitant with this, there's a change in um, drug resistance, uh, TB, very concerning resistance to this uh, uh, that uh, occurring particularly in. Uh, in and uh, asthma, delving into that a little bit more detail, basic problem there is a constriction of the bronchioles, obstructing proper exhalation of the acute precipitants. You know, you've got pollen, uh, thing that is an allergic type response can exacerbate it. Triggers mast cells, these immune cells that uh, respond to allergens and they release chemical messengers that lead to kiss of small blood vessels, friction uh, of uh, bronchioles as a uh, effective response. The way you treat it acutely, you, you know, you can adjust the sympathetic, parasympathetic balance with bronchodilators, albuterol, for example, will Sympathetic agonists that will dilate. Uh, also, anti inflammatory things that fit mast cell uh, action are important both acutely and uh, chronically. And some people with asthma are on chronic. Uh, some people take steroids, some people take monoclonal antibodies that inhibit IG binding to receptors on mast cells. Last couple of minutes before we do the case study, uh, talk about cystic fibrosis. This is uh, over secretion of mucus that's due to an impaired uh, chloride uh, conductance. So it's about uh, 30,000 uh, Americans affected in the U.S. per year, um, or total affected in the U.S. and about one in 4,000. That's present across uh, species, more uh, across races, more common in uh, Caucasians. We actually have, uh, we know the gene, it was cloned in uh, 1989 by Francis Collins. And, uh, what it is, it's, a, it's not a, a channel, but it's a, it's a pump, it's a, a, a gross transmembrane conductance regulator. It appears to be defective in terms of its folding. There are a number of different mutations that can give rise to uh, the CMS. different variants that can cause impairment. Now, Okay, you might say, well, that was a long time ago. You know, why don't we just, why aren't we just giving the CFTR back in its normal role with a adeno associated viral vector, just shooting that into the lung? I mean, be able to do that right now, right? Well, people have certainly tried that. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't work. Uh, current CFTR treatment is part of it. There are drug treatments that uh, are 
designed to try to help uh, fold the CFTR, allow it to be localized in the membrane better. Some of those look pretty good. Kaleidico uh, starting to look pretty good. Actually, that's now being broadly. But typical plastic fibrosis treatment now is you do all of these things, okay? So it's an incredibly complex chronic disease to manage. You, do, you try some CFTR modulation. Help loosen up the, the mucus with hypertonic saline. Um, digestive enzymes uh, digest the uh, digestive enzymes, but enzymes that digest the mucus. So anti-inflammatory agents, anti-infective agents, because they're constantly getting infected. They've got this build. Better nutrition, uh, uh, transplantation in the end, uh, and then you've got. A And you've got physical therapy as well, you know, mechanical disruption, uh, chronic and labor intensive. Um, but, you know, this is uh, anything to add to this in terms of the treatment? Obviously, very complex. What's your best hope for the immediate future? But it seems to work really well, right? It works really well. That one did not, has not really gotten, as far as I know, has not gotten certainly the phase. This is one of the things we don't fully understand why these are not. I think it even maybe didn't get. So let's leave time for the case study. Uh, the ventilation devices are uh, very simple, but I'm just going to uh, turn it over. I'll just, just point out one thing as he's coming up. This is a typical intubation device, actually. You could probably talk more about this. Need an acute uh, uh, ventilation of someone? You can say the structure. You can stick in a little uh, endotracheal tube. Uh, if you screw up, though, you can put it into the esophagus instead. Uh, and so you've got to make sure uh, that you're doing things right. Um, you don't want to be inflating their, their, uh, their modern uh, devices. Actually, still have. If you just put it in the wrong place, you're still able to, to ventilate. Okay. Ever have to do? Yeah. yeah. Everyone always intubates the esophagus at some point or the other. And then you learn. You always verify once you put it in the tube. So um, let's quickly go back to the case. So I read some of your answers. I haven't really given you guys scores or graded, but this will help because um, that way I don't have to write detailed answers on coursework. So we'll just summarize the case from last time, even though you guys remember. So we had Mr. M, who's a 62-year-old guy with ischemic cardiomyopathy from his coronary artery disease. He had two stents, or one stent placed in a two-vessel cabbage, uh, most recently in 2013, and chronic kidney disease. He presented to the ED, short of breath, couldn't breathe, had weight gain of about 10 to 15 pounds over the past 10 days, and chest pain with exertion. And we uh, looked at his physical exam, and he just had basically a lot of fluid retaining in his body, right? And then his labs and imaging studies showed that um, his renal function was worsening, he, his liver enzymes were starting to rise, and he had lots of fluid in his lungs. We saw those x-rays. And then we saw his echo where his heart was barely beating at all. So he's currently admitted in the CCU. And your first question was to understand what these drugs do. So I, I put, put in the answers, three, four, and five are fairly straightforward. So four is just a lipid drug for his cholesterol, five is just for his diabetes, because good, good sugar control is essential for all these sick chronic disease patients. And uh, the third one is furosemide, which is a diuretic, which most of you got correctly, just helps uh, get rid of the extra water in patients with heart failure who retain water over time. And then the first one, aspirin, and the second one is uh, clopidogrel. And so that one is basically, we give every patient with coronary artery disease aspirin. The second drug also is an antiplatelet agent that helps thin the blood and prevents clotting. And we generally give it to patients who have um, suffered an acute stroke or an acute MI or have stents. So this guy had an MI last year, so you know he could be on it for that. He would have certainly been on it in 2011 when he had a stent place. For that time, you needed for like six to 12 months, depending on the situation. So that is why he was on those drugs. And the second set is actually the heart failure medications. I think a lot of you identified them as antihypertensives or diuretics, which is true. And I think someone posted on the discussion forum this very interesting question of this patient having high blood pressure for a very long time, but now he's coming in on all these meds, but has a really low blood pressure, right? And we made this guy really sick to the point he's not perfusing his organs. So he's actually in what we call a state of shock, right? And his shock stems from his heart, so it's cardiogenic shock. 
So this is his home meds. That's how we presented the case. So the home meds in this case, for example, beta blockers are used because they've been shown to improve morbidity and mortality in heart failure. And they're not necessarily to lower their blood pressure as much as it to keep their heart rate under control and to prevent bad remodeling changes from happening to the heart. Now you can only imagine if someone's heart is not pumping blood effectively and then you just make it beat a lot faster to increase cardiac output, they're not gonna be able to, they're not gonna be able to pump effectively at all. If anything, that's really bad for them. And often patients whose heart gets dilated with a heart failure also get arrhythmias very often because their conductive tissue is not the same as it used to be, right? So beta block is essential for that kind of purpose. Same thing with enalapril, it's, used, it's basically helpful in preventing bad cardiovascular remodeling because the heart's gonna try and adapt to heart failure in bad ways and ACE inhibitors prevent those, yeah. Yes, so in general, it protects the kidneys, but in state of shock, we generally don't give them ACE inhibitors right away. So technically, when a person is in cardiogenic shock, we wouldn't give them any of this set two medications tem temporarily, because they all, they're all good for chronic management of heart failure. So when this patient gets discharged, we're gonna use them, but in the acute setting, we won't. So, and spironolactone is an interesting one because it's only used for very severe heart failure. So it's also a diuretic like furosemide. It works a little bit differently uh, on, on a different part of the nephron, on the loss uh, segment, but uh, it's only used for severe heart failure because it retains potassium. So if you give it to other people and they're not closely monitored, then it, they can die from high potassium, which causes arrhythmias, which we studied in one of the earlier lectures, why potassium is so important because it ma maintains your resting membrane potential in most electrical cells. So that's the main reason for this. I think all of you did a really good job. I think the green one was a little bit challenging because it's easy to find the antihypertensive uses of these drugs and not really the rationale why they're used in heart failure, which isn't generally to control blood pressure. Um, so the second one was, why are his kidneys failing? So we already know he has chronic kidney disease, and now his kidney is getting acutely worse, right, in a short period of time. So it's acute on chronic kidney failure. And that is oftentimes reversible to some extent. In sick patients like this, not all the way reversible. But the reason is because his heart's not pumping blood and kidneys need blood. So basically, this is a response showing that the kidneys are not being perfused very well. And I gave you a hint by increasing his liver enzymes, which tell me that his liver is not getting enough blood either. So we, and shock is basically defined as a state when your end organs, which are liver, kidney, et cetera, don't get the blood that they need. And so this proves to us that the patient is in cardiogenic shock, right? And the third question was, what are you gonna do to help him? So to help him breathe better, um, the first thing is the fluid is what's causing him to not breathe better. So we wanna remove the fluid from his lungs. I think several of you suggested thoracentesis, which isn't really something that we can do for this patient because this, fluid is in all these tiny alveoli everywhere in the lung. Thoracentesis is when you have a collection of fluid, oftentimes at the base of the lung, which we can just stick a needle in and just drain it out like a bunch of water, right? But that is not the case in this guy. He's got fluid in all his alveoli, and we need something more systemic to drain that fluid out of his body. So usually we would do furosemide, like the one he was on, but we do either a continuous IV infusion or we would do IV boluses. So it's much stronger if you give it intravenously as opposed to giving it orally. So you would give the same doses two or three times a day by injection in this IV, or you'd actually start a continuous infusion of furosemide with every second getting a few drops of furosemide in his blood, and that'll really help him get rid of that fluid. And you'll probably put a urinary catheter in him so it just continuously drains fluid out. The other thing you can do if he's still very, very uncomfortable from a respiratory perspective is you can put him on a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which a lot of you mentioned in your answer. So something like a BiPAP, which basically means it gives an extra force from the machine, which pushes open these alveoli that have been filled with water and kind of collapsing. And if that doesn't work, you just do what uh, Dr. Reiser was just telling us two minutes ago. You put an endotracheal tube and get an advanced airway because you have to protect his breathing some way. And if he can't breathe or can't handle it, then you need to support it. So those are the two things that you could do. The second thing is, um, what, what, what do we want to do to maintain adequate blood pressure? And I think it's kind of an interesting question. So he's in cardiogenic shock. He clearly has a very increased preload, right? So we kind of want to decrease that preload. Basically, we want that heart to get some of that blood out, right? And we also want the heart to increase in contractility. We didn't really go much into his afterload state because at this point, his arteries are what they are, and we're not going to try to reduce his afterload by giving him any uh, medications to reduce blood pressure because that's just going to make him sicker at this point, right? Because he's in shock. 
So in general, I think the you would try to increase this contractility, and oftentimes we do this, and we, do, we don't do this for every patient in heart failure exacerbation. Like they could be a less sicker version of this patient whose blood pressure is fine, like 100 over 60, and he's doing okay in terms of end organ perfusion, in which case we would just do the diuretics and the furosemide to get the water off. But in this guy, because he's so sick, we might have to use inotropic agents, which basically help the heart contract better. And those would be like dopamine, dibutamine, or milrinone. And like, you don't have to know the mechanisms, but they're a little complex and we don't have time. So I'll skip the mechanisms of those. But these are some of the drugs you can also give using IV infusions, and that'll help the heart beat better uh, transiently. The last one was non-pharmacological interventions. I only mentioned the device-based stuff, but many of you guys also talked about like diet therapy, low-sodium diet and everything, and that's really good. That's what we do outpatient as non-pharmacological, like good diet, good exercise. Uh, but in this case, because he's severely decompensated and end-stage heart failure, I don't think sodium restriction or water restriction alone is going to help him in the hospital. We'll obviously do that. Um, so some of the things are cardiac resynchronization devices like pacemakers, defibrillators, depending on what the underlying rhythm issues are, because the heart's dilated, the, the electrical tissue isn't going to work so well. So you need those devices to be put in sometimes. And then assist devices, which you guys also mentioned in your uh, assignments, like left ventricular assist device, right ventricular assist devices, biventricular, which is both left and right. Artificial hearts are new now, and they're being implanted in increasing frequency. They're actually not that new. The first like couple of papers are in like, the 80s, which is really strange. Stanford just started doing them last year, though. Um, I think the original research was from Arizona somewhere. Uh, and then cardiac transplantation. So uh, this kind of brings in like, you know, our former vice president got a transplant, you know, and it was like controversial because he's 70 plus and should we do it for ischemic cardiomyopathy? Should we not? Like that's a huge discussion that we can leave. And then for certain conditions which are systemic for younger patients, sometimes they need like heart and kidney or heart, liver, kidney. They're rare, but they're done and uh, they're quite fascinating. It can take like up to a day in the OR to do triple organ transplant. So I just wanted to show you a few videos uh, before you go and do your next assignment. So this one is the HeartMate video. Efficiently See pumps blood throughout the body. With heart failure, also called congestive heart failure, the heart may enlarge and its ability to pump blood so becomes impaired. It is usually caused by a failing left and or right ventricle. A ventricular assist device or VAD, such as the HeartMate, assists the failing heart by taking over the function of the diseased left ventricle and pumps blood out to the body. It can restore blood flow and allow the heart to return to near normal size and shape. With increased blood flow, the liver and kidneys may also return to a more normal condition with significantly improved function. Pump in the tubing that they're trying to show in this. The HeartMate 2 is a small and quiet advanced blood pump designed for improved outcomes with a wide range of late stage heart failure patients in need of reliable, long term circulatory support. If you hear the voice in this video, 60 percent smaller than currently uh, approved implanted accessor. electric pulsatile LVADs and uh, weighing only 400 grams. The HeartMate 2 incorporates that's precision engineering, a simple design, no, that's why and 30 years of clinical experience. For it is intended for long-term support as a bridge to transplant or for permanent implant known as destination therapy. The flows are fine. If there's a clot in the circuit, the patient The external system component of